All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 104th virtual shadowing session. Tonight's session, we are describing what makes us human, exploring brain cells one at a time with Dr. Kanapka. Next slide. All right, and here's our virtual shadowing working group, which consists of Dr. Fowler, Dr. Salazar, Dr. Nguyen, Dr. Reno, and the rest of the virtual shadowing members. Next slide. All right, and our upcoming session is on July 5th, and we have a specialty spotlight in skull-based neurosurgery. Next slide. <clears throat> and uh, during tonight's session, we will be reopening an old session, uh, session 28, and we will talk a little more about it at the end of the presentation. All right, next slide. And just a friendly reminder, if you have any questions, feel free to put it in the chat as we go along. We will have two Q&A sessions, one in the middle and one at the very end. All right, Dr. Fowler, uh, take it away. <laughs> It's such an absolute pleasure to have you with us this evening. A hundred and four lectures we've been online, can you believe it? We've actually passed out some 300,000 uh, certificates of completion that can be turned in on your application. And from the admissions committee standpoint at my institution, uh, we're really glad to see the uh, folks that are shadowing online. And we, we know that we accept those online efforts for shadowing and would very much encourage you to do that. So I know that on the admissions committee here, we want to see at least 50 or 75 hours of shadowing. And so the, these are an easy way to, uh, uh, you know, get your hand uh, uh, in the box and uh, be able to turn these hours in to, to help you get into uh, any professional school, medical professional school that you are uh, interested in. So with that, I'm just so glad to see you all here. The uh, working group um, really works hard to put these things together. It's not a small amount of time. Uh, you might uh, you might uh, put in uh, thanks working group in the chat just to let them get a little pat on the back. And with that, uh, Elena, take it away. Yeah, so I don't want to take any more of Dr. Kanapka's time. So Dr. Kanapka, take it away. Awesome. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, well, it's a, it's a real honor and pleasure to be here. And um, I am a a basic scientist, a neuroscientist at, at UT Southwestern in Dallas. And I'll be sharing with you um, just some overview of the work that we do in my lab, some vignettes. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the questions um, that you may have throughout and at the end. So um, as a species, humans, we're ultimately fascinated by understanding ourselves and by understanding ourselves and what makes us human, we may be able to unlock our full potential and understand and treat many disorders, including those that involve the brain. So while we share um, many features and behaviors with other animals on this planet, there are some behaviors that are likely unique to humans. So for example, our creative abilities, <clears throat> such as the ability to create art or music, our capabilities for technical innovation are also unmatched. So, you know, we're the only species going <clears throat> into space and launching satellites. Um, however, while humans have all of these wonderful capabilities, there are hypotheses that there's a trade-off for us evolving our enhanced cognitive abilities and evolving <clears throat> increased risk for brain disorders. So what is the cost for this increased creativity and innovation? So my lab starts from this working hypothesis. We didn't come up with this hypothesis. It's been around for some time in the field that vulnerability to disorders of cognition <clears throat> emerged as a consequence of the evolution of cognition. So if we can study brain evolution, we'll get insight into these disorders and vice versa. <clears throat> so what I like to show here is this um, timeline of human innovation. And while it's not uh, scaled uniformly, it's clear to see that human innovation has accelerated in the past couple of hundred years. So 
For example, there are about 600 years from the printing press to the invention of the steam engine, yet only 200 years have separated the invention of the telegraph and current day innovations, whatever those may be. I don't know. My daughter says it's TikTok. I'm not sure. At the same time, the prevalence of common human ailments such as depression or um, anxiety or autism have also increased. Now, I'm not implying that these two timelines are directly correlated, but the overall selective pressures that have occurred over human evolution have occurred on a much larger time scale, but they may have resulted in increased risk for brain disorders um, in particular. So <clears throat> thinking about this time scale, the common ancestor of humans and our closest genetic relatives, the chimpanzees and bonobos, diverged roughly 5 million years ago. And within that time frame, humans and chimpanzees, for example, have retained some similarities. And Certainly our genomes are very similar, but even Jane Goodall cannot communicate with the chimpanzee as well as you and I can communicate with one another. So what are the goals of our research? Well, we're asking what are the mechanisms of brain diseases? How have human brains evolved? How do brain diseases and evolution intersect? And yeah, those are the three. So, Here's a, a really interesting slide with a lot of uh, brains on it. And obviously as a neuroscientist, I'm very biased when I come to think about um, the evolution of humans with respect to the brain. Um, it's clear when you look at this, that there's something special about human brains. So this is 34 different uh, primate brains. And you can see that the human brain is indeed the largest and also the most complex in terms of the folding of the outer surface of the brain called the neocortex. Um, in addition, if uh, one looks beyond primates and includes other um, mammals or birds and fish, reptiles, and you compare body weight to brain weight, what you can see is that humans are um, an outlier here. So we have a much larger brain compared to our average body weight. And there's something very special about that in my mind. So um, this difference in overall human brain structure can be clearly seen when we compare it to commonly used uh, animal models for brain research, such as here shown in the mouse, and this is drawn roughly to scale, uh, the rhesus monkey uh, macaque, and now here, uh, if it works, is the human brain. So hopefully you can appreciate uh, this difference in size. So not only is the mouse brain much smaller, but it's smooth or lysencephalic compared to the monkey brain, which starts to have some folds, and then the human brain, which has uh, a large amount of folding at its surface. And this increased folding leads to an overall significant increase in the total brain surface area. And as I already mentioned, this part of the brain is called the neocortex, and it's thought to be very important for um, cognitive function and also at risk in many brain disorders that involve cognition. Now, um, for hundreds, I'll give you a brief history, very brief history of neuroscience and behavior thinking about brain regions. So for hundreds of years, uh, humans, we had an inkling that the brain was important for behavior. So at first we thought that just by studying um, the shape of our skulls, so-called phrenology, that we could understand how and why uh, we behave. And this all changed about 180 years ago when a railroad worker uh, called, named Phineas Gage had an accident when an exploding rod went through his skull and brain and he survived. And so this distinctive change in Mr. Gage's personality began our understanding that this part of the neocortex that was hit by the rod, the frontal lobe, is important for cognitive behaviors like executive control flexibility. A few decades later, uh, Dr. Paul Broca examined the brain of a patient uh, who had a very specific progressive loss of spoken language while he was alive. And then after he passed away, 
They took his brain out of his skull and they identified that there was this lesion here in his brain on the lateral side of the frontal cortex, specifically on the left side of the brain. Now this brain region is frequently called Broca's area and is thought to be very important for spoken language. And then finally, um, more recently in the mid 20th century, a what I call a cortex adjacent re region or the hippocampus um, was also linked to a specific human behavior. So this particular patient, patient HM had neurosurgery for severe uh, epilepsy and both hippocampi, so there's one on the left and one on the right side of your brain were removed. And after they did that, while the epilepsy was treated, patient HM could no longer form new memories. So this definitively linked this part of the brain, the hippocampus, to memory. And so together, uh, these examples really illustrate and have motivated decades of neuroscience research. And in order to understand this contribution of specific brain regions to um, behavior and cognition. So now... At the same time, while neuroscientists were trying to understand the contribution of specific regions to um, brain function, they, they were also delving into how specific cell types might play a role um, in a given region and hopefully someday in a specific behavior. So for example, this image, these images here on this slide <clears throat> are taken from a very famous neuroscientist, uh, Ramoni Cajal, who over a hundred years ago made these beautiful images of the brain that just really documented only probably a fraction of the diversity of the cell types uh, within the neocortex, this outer part uh, of the brain. So what do we know about brain cell types? So I'll just give you a few facts uh, about brain cells. So there are 170 billion cells in the human brain so if you put that in perspective, that's on par with the number of stars in the Milky Way. So this is a very large number of cells. It makes it very challenging uh, to study the brain. And we just really don't know um, all the different types of cells in the brain. So as I already mentioned, you know, from the time of Ramon e. Cajal, we've been studying um, brain types by just looking at their so-called neuroanatomy, like the shape and the size. In um, recent technology, for example, illustrated here in this rainbow mice, we can um, start to understand how different cell types are connected to one another and understand like the systems and the circuits of the brain. And together, both of these approaches have provided us with um, a lot of very useful information. <clears throat> However, my lab is really focused on a different aspect of um, understanding brain cell types. So we know that each cell in your body has roughly 3 billion letters of DNA that code for over 20,000 um, genes and then proteins. And the interesting thing about that and what is really remarkable is that each cell in your body has the same DNA, yet different genes are turned on or off in each cell. And so that's a way in, we believe that, um, you know, evolution has allowed us to drive cell type identity and function and really underscores uh, this diversity. So um, this concept of um, cell type, what I call cell type specific gene expression can be illustrated by going back to, I think probably what you learned in high school biology, the so-called central dogma of molecular biology. So every cell has the same DNA and um, in each cell, different genes are turned on or off to transcribe RNA at different amounts. These RNA molecules are in turn um, translated into proteins. And um, you know, for a substantial amount of the mRNAs, this tracks pretty well with the proteins. You can see in this theoretical example, this caught one red mRNA becomes one red protein, two green RNAs become two green proteins. And what's been really wonderful is that for the past 20 years or so, we've been able to measure and quantitate with high fidelity uh, the amounts of RNA in tissue in quite a number of ways. And so we've been able to quantitate. We, we're still not yet where we need to be for looking at proteins and quantitating it in, in brain tissue, but that I think will be coming soon. So 
while we can quantitate these measures of RNA, it's still really challenging because of how this diversity may change across the brain. So not every cell type in every region will express a gene at the same level. So even a, for example, a neuron in the neocortex might um, express different levels of a gene depending on where, whether, for example, here, this neuron in the front part of the cortex, the frontal cortex has one copy of this red gene. And in the back in the visual cortex part of the brain, it may express two copies of this red protein. So you may even ask yourself, well, is this then even the same cell type? And that's something we really don't know. And that's what we're really trying to figure out. Maybe they look alike, they connect to similar regions, but if they're expressing different proteins, maybe they have other functions we can't yet measure. Now, in addition to neurons, which probably everyone in the call has heard about, and we think of as like the workhorses of the brain and kind of, you know, really doing all the functions, there are many other, um, let's call them major cell types in the brain that play critical roles communicating with and interacting with neurons. So these will include um, astrocytes or oligodendrocytes, and also, let's see here, microglia. And um, <clears throat> within each of these major cell types, there are potentially dozens or hundreds of what I would call subtypes of cells. Um, so this is just kind of an illustration of, you know, pictures of other sort of cell types throughout the brain. So for example, within the neocortex, there are um, dozens of what are called interneurons um, within major cortical regions alone. So to understand how the same DNA in each cell leads to the diversity of cell types in the human brain, we really need to be able to measure gene expression or RNA levels in single cells throughout the brain. So we can know that, you know, we're, what diversity we're actually um, capturing. So this idea of measuring uh, gene expression in each cell of the human brain, and indeed the entire human body is the mission of the human cell atlas. So I'm just gonna read their mission statement and I'm a part of this group. Uh, so to create comprehensive reference maps of all human cells, the fundamental units of life as a basis for both understanding human health and diagnosing, monitoring and treating uh, disease. So in 2017, uh, my lab was part of the first cohort of labs to receive funding to start profiling tissues as part of this human cell atlas. So we were in labs basically around the world that were funded to study human brain at single cell resolution. Now there are many groups funded from a variety of sources, whether that's, you know, NIH or uh, NSF or other private foundations to examine this. So it's really a, an exciting time to build all of these <clears throat> data sets and integrate them together. So, um, how do we go about doing this? How do we measure RNA levels in single cells? So we're using an approach called single cell genomics. And if I can get this um, video to work, it's gonna show you a nice cartoon of it. Let's see. I may have to get rid of this laser pointer, hold on. Okay, here we go. The workflow begins with initial tissue preparation, which involves isolating the cells from their native environment through mechanical isolation, enzymatic digestion, or a combination of the two. The method for this step depends on the types of cells that need to be prepared into a viable single cell suspension. From there, the single cells need to be isolated and compartmentalized. There are several available methods for isolating single cells, and your approach depends on your experimental priorities and throughput. Microfluidic technologies enable high throughput single cell profiling of up to tens of thousands of cells per experiment. Micro wells can also capture individual cells at high throughput. Once cells have been isolated and compartmentalized, they are lysed to prepare your target library for sequencing. Here, the target being interrogated is barcoded in a way that allows you to identify which cell it came from. Now, library prep begins. The method will depend on whether you're studying the genome, epigenome, transcriptome, or protein expression. Regardless, your chosen target will be amplified and prepped for sequencing. Next, prepared libraries are loaded onto your sequencer of choice. The final step is data analysis and visualization. Okay. Great, so that worked. Um, the work.
Sorry, you don't need to see that again. Um, yeah, so, oh, I'm not gonna play this. This is just a homemade video from my own lab, just showing you like little, these droplets going through, but this, um, let's see if I can get this on the screen. This um, cartoon, I think illustrates at least the approach we're taking. The video mentioned two different ways of capturing, but I'll, I'll just kind of summarize it here. Um, so you have a tissue, in this case, the brain, you break it up or you dissociate it through a variety of steps into individual cells or nuclei. And then you pass it through this microfluidic device. And at the same time, it's passing through these um, beads. And the goal is in an individual oil droplet, you get one cell and one bead. And then through a series of steps that I won't go into detail here, you're able to accurately quantitate each transcript. So you'll know with absolute like, you know, there were two copies of the red gene, there were five copies of the green gene, and then you can do this and assign it to a specific cell. Oh, still gonna play that, sorry guys. And then you get this output that we call a UMAP. Okay. You get this output, that's a UMAP, and each one of these dots represents an individual cell. And in this case, it's tens of thousands of cells. And cells that are more similar to one another based on their RNA profile will end up clustering together. And so this may represent one inhibitory neuron. This cluster up here may represent one subtype of oligodendrocytes, for example. Okay, so this single cell technology was first developed around uh, 2009, but that only measured RNA in one cell. Now, uh, seven years ago, Roughly, uh, the technology incorporated that microfluidics device that I showed you the video and the cartoon of, and this allowed us to measure um, tens of thousands of cells. So in this publication uh, from a group at Harvard, they were able to measure 45,000 cells. And um, I'll just, so some of the ones I just highlighted here are kind of just like seminal ones in the field. And you can see that a lot of these just came out in the the last few years. For example, these two lakes, this one's highly cited in the field. So the question then arises, how can we apply this technology, single cell genomics, to understand um, what I introduced in the beginning of the talk, brain evolution and disease? And so I have um, three brief vignettes. I'll just give you a snapshot of the data um, where my labs applied this technology. So one is human, looking at the human hippocampus across its long axis, uh, the human versus non-human primate uh, neocortex. And then finally, how we're using a human brain, so-called brain organoids um, to understand human brain development. So I already introduced uh, the hippocampus, but I'll just make uh, a few more points because this is critical to the, um, the vignette, the hippocampus, as I already said, it's a bilateral structure in the brain and it derives its name for the Greek, from the Greek word for seahorse because this is a human hippocampus. This is what it looks like if you take it out of the brain. And so it looks kind of like a seahorse. It's pretty remarkable. And I mentioned that the hippocampus became famous or really high on neuroscientists radar when um, patient HM had his entire hippocampus, both sides, removed and couldn't form new memories. So from these since then decades of research on the hippocampus have taught us that it's critical for formation of episodic memory and spatial memory. It's involved in learning and emotional regulation and that dysfunction of the hippocampus is associated with many brain um, diseases, including but not limited to uh, dementia, depression and schizophrenia. So there's a really interesting feature of the hippocampus that um, even maybe some basic neuroscientists don't always think about that. And it's really based on the shape of it and the potential different functions that it carries out based on where you are along what's called this longitudinal axis. And hopefully um, you can appreciate that the shape is a bit different, um, for example, in a non-human primate to a human primate. So this would be the posterior versus the um, anterior portion of the human hippocampus. In a rodent, a lot of basic science, neuroscience is done in rodents. They call it the um, dorsal ventral axis because it's shaped a bit differently. But this um, 
longitudinal access of the hippocampus is important because of what we know about the differences and how uh, each part of it may be connected to different parts of the brain. So for example, the anterior, the front part of the hippocampus is known, and this is not exclusive, but it's just primarily connected to the amygdala and therefore is involved in uh, emotional responses, mood and affect. Whereas the posterior, the back part of the hippocampus has uh, a very strong uh, connection to the neocortex and therefore uh, is quite important uh, in, in cognitive function. And so my lab wanted to understand how cell types along this longitudinal axis might be important. So we wanted to know how the cell types in the anterior versus the cell types in the posterior part of the camp, hippocampus might be involved in these very you know, different behaviors. So using this single cell technology that I introduced, we could assess whether the um, proportion of cell types changed along the axis or whether specific genes went up or down uh, depending on their location in the anterior versus the posterior part of the hippocampus. And so several groups um, had been doing this in rodent, but um, until the time that we started doing this work, um, no human study had been carried out using this uh, single cell approach. Okay, so now inserted into my presentation is a pause for Q&A. Yes, uh, we do have a lot of questions already. Um, I'll just go through a couple. One question we have is, when it comes to the increased number of diagnoses of mental disorders, to what degree do you think our increased ability to produce accurate diagnosis is inflating, inflating it? Uh, so the question is whether it's the increase is really due to our ability to have an accurate diagnosis or not, if I'm yes. Yeah, I mean, that's um, certainly people talk about that all the time. And I think now, I mean, I'm not a clinician, so I'm a basic scientist, but I do understand that there's ascertainment issues and also within um, individual, you know, things that we've lumped together. For example, just thinking about schizophrenia, which for a hundred years, you know, we would call schizophrenia. I worked very closely. You'll see a slide with Carol Tamingo, who's the chair of psychiatry. And one of her research aims is about, um, you know, biotypes, subtypes of schizophrenia, right? And those are really hard to diagnose, um, from a, like at the clinical level, but using brain imaging, she's been able to pull out different um, biotypes of, of schizophrenia. So, um, you know, it, it, it goes back and forth in the field, lumping versus splitting individuals into these um, names and diagnoses. So it's, it's hard as a scientist when we get samples from patients to know, you know, how much, you know, differences in diagnosis may play a role. Yes, so it sounds very complex. Yeah. And then another question we have is, is the percentage of mental disorders between first world and tribal populations similar or different? Tribal populations. Um, well, I'll just say around the world, um, the incidence of most major, so schizophrenia, it's like 1%, no matter where you are in the world where they've examined autism. There've been many studies, um, not just for example, in the US and Europe, but all over, um, Asia, they're starting to do more in um, Africa. I think we're going to find similar rates. Um, you know, there's there's some bot, you know, genetic bottlenecks at play here too, and these are all genetic disorders, so it's not clear yet how those come into play for some of these. But yeah, the rates have, have tended to be pretty similar no matter what population you look at. Okay, I'll do a couple more. Uh, one question is. How are the different cell types in the brain discovered or identified? Ah, so um, as I sort of touched upon before, we used to just call uh, cells different based on how they looked. Then it was based on how they were connected. Um, and then uh, we, we meaning the greater, not me, the greater community um, identified molecular markers. So for example, one gene we study, FOXP2. If you throw an antibody to FOXP2 on a neocortex, it only lights up certain excitatory neurons in the lower layers. So it became a marker for layer six excitatory neurons. So 
then we started, you know, then we got into this mode of like, oh, single genes, single cell types, but it's actually the combinatorial expression of many genes that I think defines a cell type. Okay. And then I'll do one more question. And apart from gene expression, is there anything else that can cause the differentiation of cells or neurons? Are there any extracellular, extracellular influences on neuron dif differentiation? Certainly extracellular factors play a role in the early brain development. I mean, growth factors are really directing um, how the brain develops. Um, obviously, I'm giving you a very biased view, but um, and neuronal activity, right, is the major player after the brain has developed. In an adult brain, like my brain, I'm not really making um, a lot of new cells, but the cells that are there are still hopefully able to form new memories and have new functions. And that's based on neurotransmitters, um, you know, signaling to one another, but there are cascades of gene expression that are required uh, for those uh, activity dependent mechanisms. So there's always a little bit of gene expression sprinkled in. Okay, well, thank you so much. I'll let you continue your presentation. Great, those are great questions. I love all of these questions. Okay. So let's see, where did I take off? So uh, leave off. So I was talking about our study of the human hippocampus across the um, longitudinal axis. So to do this, where do we even get human hippocampal tissue? Well, it requires really good collaborations between basic scientists and clinicians. And so UT Southwestern is a wonderful place to carry out this uh, research. So access to this tissue. So unlike peripheral tissues like skin or blood, it's obviously one can imagine um, hard to get human brain tissue. So typically neuroscientists have relied upon brain tissue that's donated uh, by individuals or next of kin uh, upon death. <clears throat> so I worked, as I've already mentioned, very closely with Dr. Carol Tominga, who's the chair of psychiatry at UT Southwestern, who runs a uh, brain bank where um, individuals donate um, brain tissue post-mortem. That's a great source of brain tissue. There may be some limitations for certain projects with that tissue. So we've also been using surgical brain tissue. So this is brain tissue from patients who are undergoing neurosurgery, an open craniotomy, for example. And this tissue is really great quality for using in uh, the single cell studies. And this is indeed the uh, type of tissue we used for this study. And of course, you know, we can't just get any brain tissue from a patient undergoing a neurosurgical procedure. It can only be tissue that's being removed for other reasons. So in this case, um, for the hippocampal study, the tissue was removed um, because all of the patients had epilepsy. And so it was removed kind of like patient HM, except in this case, they're not removing both uh, sides of the hippocampus. And in our study, even though the patients have epilepsy, we only use tissue that was deemed pathologically normal. Now, of course, you could argue that if all these individuals had epilepsy, so how can you claim any part of the brain is quote unquote normal? Well, you know, we have certain metrics to at least show that, you know, there's not a lot of um, cell death. There's not a lot of what we call reactive gliosis where it's clear that the cells are kind of um, accommodating for abnormal activity. And so this was a collaboration with uh, Dr. Brad Lega, who is a faculty member at UT Southwestern in the neurosurgery uh, department. This is his picture. And this is a, a postdoc, former postdoc in the lab, uh, Dr. Fatma Ihan, who carried out uh, this tissue. So, um, and this, this is a study that was published last year. So you could look up um, this paper. So what we used was this surgically resected hippocampus. Um, we divided it into the anterior and the posterior portion of the hippocampus. And then Fatma carried out this approach of single cell profiling. And um, again, just as a reminder, all of these patients were having neurosurgery for drug resistant epilepsy. Otherwise, if the drugs could treat their epilepsy, they wouldn't have to undergo the surgery. Um, so here, so in the end, we had um, five patients who contributed tissue that was deemed uh, pathologically uh, usable for our study. This is, these are um, MRI images of these patients, it's just a zoom in of showing the location from a different uh, angle. But here highlighted in orange is the anterior and then blue, the posterior portion that was removed from these 
five individuals. And so um, again, we had five anterior, five posterior, FOTMA carried out this single cell genomics approach. And here is the output, this uh, so-called U map, so map of the cells. And in this case, there are represented in this image, 130,000 cells. So again, each dot represents an individual cell. They kind of all run together because they're piled on top of one another. And the closer they are together in space, the more similar they are at the RNA level. So here we have uh, clusters, five clusters of cell types that we annotated as uh, oligodendrocytes, for example. Then what we can do is build these so-called uh, violin plots. So if you imagine this is like a violin on its uh, side um, and um, the longer and the fatter the violin, the more highly expressed that gene is in a cluster. So for example, here, this gene, RBFOX3, also called new N, it's expressed in all neurons. So here we have represented pyramidal neurons, dentate gyrus neurons, inhibitory neurons. Whereas in a contra, and you can see here just these lines here in the non-neuronal cell types like oligodendrocytes or microglia or astrocytes, there's very low expression. On the other hand, um, this gene, MOBP, which is a myelin-associated oligodendrocyte basic protein, uh, you can see high expression in the oligodendrocyte clusters and low to little uh, expression in the non-oligodendrocyte clusters. So here I'm just highlighting those for you. Okay, so this is a great basic um, map of what was going on and major cell types, but um, we wanted to know whether the cells, the whole point was to understand this longitudinal anterior versus posterior axis. So we, we could color this map based on whether a cell came from the anterior in gray <clears throat> or posterior in purple part of the hippocampus. And so you might say, oh, this cluster of dentate gyrus neurons is overrepresented for posterior hippocampal neurons. But the problem is these dots can lie on top of one another. So it can be a bit misleading when you look at these plots. So instead, what we typically do is make these um, stacked bar plots, and then we can plot the proportion of cell types contributed by the anterior versus the posterior hippocampus for each of these cell clusters. And then we can apply some statistical analysis. And so here where you see these asterisks, these three um, cell types were significantly different in the anterior versus posterior. These two dentate gyrus um, uh, clusters were significantly overrepresented for posterior cells. And this pyramidal neuron cluster was overrepresented here for gray for um, anterior cells. So indeed these um, findings did support a change in the proportion, proportional contribution of cell types along the anterior posterior axis. So that's one of the advantages of using this approach. Now, of course we, want to know about disease. And we wanted to know whether genes were increased or decreased along the longitudinal axis. And we identified hundreds of genes that what we call differentially expressed along this axis. But we wanted to relate this back to brain function and disease. Um, and I know this is a busy slide, so I'll try and animate and walk it through. So we have a number of um, databases of genes that defines whether a gene is associated with a specific brain disorder like epilepsy, um, ADHD, autism, bipolar disorder, major depression, Alzheimer's disease, schizophrenia. We also have genes that are associated with so-called normal brain function, like cognitive function or intelligence. And then we can overlap um, these databases of gene function with our differentially expressed genes. And then the bigger the circle, um, the more significant that is shown here with this FDR false discovery rate, more significant the overlap would be between the two conditions. The color indicates up in posterior versus anterior. So what was really uh, nice, again, we're looking at genes going up and down, is that genes that were significantly increased in the anterior portion of the hippocampus were um, significantly overlapping with genes uh, involved in um, 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 affect, right? So here we have bipolar mood, bipolar disorder, major depression, schizophrenia. Uh, 
written out for you. In contrast, genes that were differentially expressed in the posterior portion of the hippocampus, highlighted here, significantly overlapped with those involved in cognitive function or intelligence. So this, these data really supported this concept of anterior hippocampus being connected to the amygdala emotional response, mood affect, posterior hippocampus to the cortex cognitive function. And now from this data, you can't see it here. This is just a representation. We have specific genes in specific cell types that can distinguish anterior versus posterior. We also have changes in cell type proportion. So now this represents a massive opportunity. It's published for neuroscientists to dig into these genes and cell types and do more um, functional tests, whether it's in an animal model or in some other way to understand the role of these genes in either these disorders or in normal hippocampal function. Okay, so that was vignette one, a very condensed view of the cell types in the human hippocampus. The other vignette is uh, about understanding human brain evolution and this idea that if we understand evolution, we'll understand human cognition. So um, there are key aspects of brain evolution that are altered in brain disorders such as schizophrenia or autism. So for example, compared to chimpanzee, the human brain has increased uh, neuronal complexity. And this uh, neuronal function is often uh, disrupted in these disorders. Another example is that self-consciousness and more complex theory of mind is thought to distinguish humans from non-human primates. These features are also often um, altered in many cognitive disorders with an altered sense of self or an inability to interpret uh, others. And so in 2019, we published a study, this is, there are three wonderful postdocs in the lab, lots of collaborators, where we asked what major cell types might contribute to human brain evolution at the gene expression level? How might these uh, patterns be disrupted in schizophrenia? And so here we were looking at the frontal cortex, also called Broadman, a Broadman area 46, and we had post, these are all postmortem tissues from humans, either unaffected individuals, individuals with schizophrenia, and then we had matched tissue from chimpanzee and rhesus macaque. And we were able to isolate not individual cells in this case, the technology is not quite yet accessible when we started it, but we could isolate all neurons or all um, oligodendrocytes from these uh, chunks of brain tissue. And what was remarkable, it was a really fascinating study, was that the genes that were, um, that went down specifically uh, in the human brain are genes that were upregulated in the brains of individuals with schizophrenia. And the genes that were up specifically in the human brain represented here are downregulated in the brains of individuals with schizophrenia. Sorry, I had this animated. Um, so this really, this finding supported this hypothesis that there's a trade-off between brain evolution and disease. But we were a bit limited because we only had major cell types. It was only neurons versus oligodendrocytes. And as I hopefully convinced you in the beginning of the talk, there are many different subtypes of neurons and other cells. So then Emery, uh, a graduate student in the lab, wanted to build upon this and really expand it to look at cell types using this single cell approach. So in this case, we shifted to the posterior cingulate cortex. It's further back in the cortex. And we had tissue from humans, chimpanzee, and rhesus macaque. We chose this brain region because there's a clear anatomical homology uh, among the species. It's involved in higher order cognition, and it's also disrupted in schizophrenia patients. All of this tissue, again, post-mortem samples, they died from natural and or non-brain related causes. No animals were harmed in, for this study. So um, based on our previous findings in oligodendrocytes, um, we wanted to examine specifically uh, cell types in the oligodendrocyte lineage. And this is just showing this lineage going all the way from a precursor cell uh, that can form any cell type to an oligodendrocyte precursor cell to an immature oligodendrocyte to a mature myelinating oligodendrocyte. So we carried out this single cell profiling uh, 
experiment across the species. And here is that UMAP that represents all of the cell types, specifically in the oligodendrocytes, all the way from precursors to myelinating across these three species. And what we then wanted to look at, now that we had this data in hand from this brain region, looking at all the dendrocytes across species, first thing we wanted to do was to look at the proportion of each of these cell types for the three species. And one of the first things that really struck us was here, when we looked at these precursor, right, at the very beginning, early part of the lineage, there seemed to be, compared to the other cell types, this overrepresentation of these, of these cell types being um, more found in humans here, shown in blue. So to test this more uh, formally, because we have to grind up the tissue, right, to do the single cell profile, and we wanted to see if this remained uh, in this, the same thing in an intact um, piece of tissue. And so to do this, we used what's called, as a fancy name, single molecule fluorescence in situ hybridization. So we can keep our cortical tissue intact. Here's the human tissue. Here's the chimpanzee tissue. And then we have specific probes for either a progenitor here in OPC or a mature oligodendrocytes here with MOG. And we can do this across numerous uh, tissue from numerous individuals. And then it's single molecule. So we can quantitate this. And we had a team of scientists in the lab who did this because it's really challenging experiment. Um, and what we found was that there was a significant difference, again, in the number of progenitors, OPCs, to mature oligodendrocytes. So this fit exactly with what our single cell RNA sequencing data showed us. It was an independent way of proving this. We also replicated this in other um, data sets. And so it's a pretty remarkable finding because to date, most people have been really focused on neurons for brain evolution. And here we're showing that this um, rate of maturation or perhaps differences in just the steady state levels of the proportions of these cell types um, are changing, um, is changing across evolution. And so we also know that neuronal activity shown here in all these little red dots indicated by NMDA, AMPA, glutamate receptors, transport, neuronal activity. So the neurons that the oligodendrocytes interface with can also play a role. So we hypothesize that this change in this ratio, specifically in the human brain, is really allowing human, the human brain to have this enhanced potential for ex experience dependent generation of mature oligodendrocytes. So I like to think this is what's keeping me on my toes as an older individual, that I have this as a human, this change in this ratio. So my neurons and oligodendrocytes can fire and respond um, and learn and be plastic and learn new things. So we think this is really a, a potential mechanism for evolved human brain plasticity. So how do we then follow up and understand single disease genes in cell types? So from everything I've shown you, basically we're starting really big and we're trying to narrow down to specific genes, but then we have to do experiments, right? To understand the contribution of these individual genes to brain functions. So um, how do we do, do this at the cell type level? So we can use model systems where we can manipulate genes and in um, the neuroscience field, We've got a lot of traction with using uh, rodents, with using flies, now more recently um, songbirds and, and monkeys. And then we can manipulate genes or modify them using viruses that either overexpress or knock down genes, or more recently these um, molecular scissors, CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing to kind of cut out pieces of DNA to cut out genes or modify genes. And these are all great and my lab uses uh, and collaborates with people who do a number of model systems. Um, but today I'm just on my final vignette, my final little story from the lab, tell you about how we can also use uh, human brain cells in a dish. And so in this model, what we do or other people do is they take skin cells and they can reprogram them through a series of steps into brain cell types. And then using a number of other series steps, whether it's spinning or adding growth factors or in matrigel, you can turn these into what are called organoids. So kind of mini brains in a dish. It's not really a brain, but it has 
some of the early developmental properties uh, of a brain. And so uh, the final vignettes really focuses on one gene that's been implicated in autism. Autism, I already kind of mentioned, it's increasing in prevalence. It's very common. Current estimates are one in 44 US children. Its diagnosis is based on changes in uh, social communication and repetitive behaviors and interests. And uh, those are often uh, happen in motor systems. There are a few, um, there's no cure. There are a few treatments um, for these. And most of them are just, you know, either to help with um, maybe hyperactivity or hopefully for sleep. A lot of individuals have um, challenges with sleep. And so my lab has, we know that there's a strong genetic component to autism. It's highly heritable. Um, so we've studied one gene, this gene FOXP1, that if you have a mutation or a change in common variation of FOXP1, you're almost without doubt going to get autism or what is now being called FOXP1 syndrome. And so as you can see from these um, images, many of these individuals um, have very similar uh, facial features. Almost all of these individuals have been um, diagnosed with autism. They have significant social challenges. Almost all of them have absence of language. They also have significant motor defects. And um, my lab and others, here are just some of the publication, we've studied FOXP1 in many different animal models, primarily uh, in rodent models. We've shown in this part of the brain, the striatum, FOXP1 can mediate these cell-specific gene expression changes that are relevant to autism. They can also mediate different types of behaviors depending on if we manipulate FOXP1 in one cell type versus another. In the neocortex, uh, FOXP1 is important for how neurons migrate and develop. It's also important for how um, these animal models vocalize and social behavior. And so this is a collaboration with Jay Gibson at UT Southwestern. We've also collaborated with Todd Roberts to understand how FOXP1 could mediate memory-related vocal learning in a songbird. But as I said, I'm just gonna finally show you how this happens, how we study this gene um, in human cells. So just as a reminder, human brain, the neocortex is expanded inside, has greater folding. So we, you know, we really wanna understand um, how that happens. So one cell type within the neocortex has been really focused on a lot um, within evolutionary um, neuroscience. And it's this cell type called um, outer radial glia or ORGs, or sometimes called basal radial glia or BRGs. And um, these cells, I mean, it depends on how you define it, exist in the rodent brain, but there are many more of them uh, in the, the human brain. And this uh, greater number of these ORG cells might probably certainly facilitates the generation of more neurons and in turn a larger neocortex uh, in the human brain. Now in the um, rodent, FOXP1 has little to no expression in these ORGs. However, in the human brain, um, it's abundantly expressed in the cell types. And um, this FOXP1 is what's called a transcription factor. So it sits on DNA to regulate and turn on or off the expression of other genes. And so we thought it would be reasonable to carry out single cell genomics in a human cell system that hopefully would be generating ORGs and that we could manipulate expression of FOXP1 and see how that um, leads to a phenotype. And so this was the um, PhD project of a recently graduated student in the lab, uh, Emily, and she carried out um, making these human brain organoids starting with um, stem cells. So over, six over a six week um, differentiation time, you can get these organoids. She then used these molecular scissors to cut out the entire FOXP1 genes. And then genes, she could grow either wild type, so control organoids, or either knockout one or knockout two organoids. And hopefully you can see here FOXP1 shown here, nice expression in the wild type organoids, completely gone where she used the scissors to cut it out. Um, and then yes, illustrated here, what she could do is measure a number of things. So one of the things was to look at how these, in this case, she's calling it BRGs, 
changed in the wild type compared to knockout. And this is just a schematic of a lot of work she did showing that when you removed FOXP1, there was a significant loss of cells that we identified as these important evolutionary progenitors, these ORGs or BRGs. And then finally, since FOXP1 regulates gene expression, she carried out single cell profiling, right? It's binding to DNA. So she did this. She collaborated with a research assistant professor in the lab, Ashwini Kumar. Here's her beautiful UMAP of over 150,000 cells where she's highlighting either intermediate progenitors, neurons, or radial glial cells. This is just the same map now where she's highlighting the specific cell type, the ORG, BRGs, and they fell into two clusters. And both of these clusters had high expression of FOXP1, which is great because remember, I wanted to have a model system, a human model system that had high expression of FOXP1 in this cell type. And indeed, she was able to find that. And then she next asked, well, okay, when we manipulate FOXP1 in these organoids, in this cell type, what are the genes that are changing? Do any genes change? And we found many genes changing but the ones that I really wanna highlight was that um, in these BRGs, these evolutionarily important uh, cell type, so the bigger the circle, the more enrichment, we found a significant enrichment of genes that were already known to be important for autism. So you manipulate FOXP1 in this cell type, evolutionarily important cell type in a human system. And what happens is you get dysregulation of a number of autism genes. And this is just showing you what some of those genes are. So what could we do next with these data? How do we understand FOXP1? So this list of genes in this specific cell type now represents druggable targets for uh, individuals with these FOXP1 uh, syndrome phenotypes. So I like to think of this as like, this sort of example is allowing us now in the future, it's still a long way off, to think about cell-specific gene therapy because FOXP1 is expressed in a lot of cell types in the brain, throughout the body. And so we don't wanna be necessarily um, changing levels in all cell types, depending on an individual's uh, particular uh, phenotypes. And we can first start with the manipulation of these genes and pathways um, in animal models, and then you know, move on from there to human um, system. So to summarize what I showed you here tonight is that the human brain is comprised of many types of cells that uh, single cell genomics can give us insight into a number of things. So fundamental properties of human brain function, how the human brain evolved, the contribution of individual disease relevant genes to brain development and function, and that's it. And this is just the evolution of my lab over the years all the current and previous lab members who do all the work. I'm very grateful to all of their work. Uh, we have had many generous funders over the years, so thanks to them. And I just wanna you know, thank you for your attention, for attending this, for the questions. And even after this talk is over, if you have questions, this is my email where you can reach me. And I will turn to the Q&A. Uh, yes, thank you so much. This was such a great presentation. We still have a lot of questions, so I'll go ahead and start. What inspired you to pursue this specific field of study and research topic? Well, I mean, I think is, well, I've, first of all, I've always, when I entered graduate school, my goal was to understand cognitive disorders, you know, bipolar, depression, schizophrenia, I think almost probably everyone on this call has a family member, knows someone that, you know, suffers from these very common disorders. So I wanted to understand them more so we could develop better treatments. And so I started from that. And then I became just really fascinated along the way with evolution and reading more about how that intersected with disease just really um, sparked something in me to pursue this. And I think it's exciting. All right, and then the next question we have is, do brain cells replicate? If yes, can this have a greater purpose? Do brain cells replicate? Well, I mean, definitely in early development, we have these progenitors that are dividing um, to form more progenitors or neurons or non-neurons like glial cells. The, um, the question of what's called adult neurogenesis 
is a kind of controversial field uh, for humans. There's some evidence from uh, carbon dating, like exposure to radiation, that it's still happening in humans and certainly in our olfactory tract it's happening, but whether it's kind of global throughout the brain, um, I think is a still a bit debatable, but so I would say be very um, gentle to the brain cells you have. You may not be able to replace a lot of them, um, but certainly during development, there's a lot of proliferation. Okay. And another question we have is, do you observe induced autism in the model animals or is it observable via molecular markers? Induced autism, was that the question? Yes. Um, there are some ways that other labs can induce um, either uh, anatomical or behavioral features in animal models, such as um, valproic acid is a common one. Uh, I'm trying I'm off the top of my head, I'm blanking. Typically, we do genetic m manipulations that mimic um, genetic changes in um, human patients, and then we study that way. Um, but there, you know, it's a mouse. I would never say a mouse has autism. Um, it doesn't, but we can study features. We can study how the brain is important for social behaviors, or we could study in a songbird, how the brain is important for vocal learning. And that basic knowledge is important for understanding, you know, human behavior. Okay. And then another question we have is, how do you suppose the landscape of treatment options for autism spectrum disorders will evolve over the upcoming years? Right, I mean, that's a great question. So there's a huge effort at UT Southwestern and around the world to develop um, gene therapies. So if you know in an individual what genes are <clears throat> altered, if you could restore normal function of that gene, would that help? Uh, even in an, in an adult. So a lot of people are looking and, you know, gene therapy is a thing for um, other sorts of issues, I believe, you know, like in the retina and, um, you know, there are other ways that gene therapies and other uh, nervous system disorders, no one's really done it yet for cognitive disorder to my knowledge. So that's certain, certainly, I think on the table, the mechanism, whether it's going to be viral or antisense oligonucleotide or some other novel mechanism, I don't know. There's also a push for um, things like transcranial magnetic stimulation. So if we can just, you know, kind of like active, reset the brain through some sort of stimulation, we don't really know the mechanism of that. Um, maybe that would be helpful. And then of course, you know, I think of where our research I hope would go is that if we understand pathways that are active in cell types, we can then you know, through drug screens, understand, okay, here's a drug, it targets this pathway and this cell type, take, you know, give this to subsets of individuals, and maybe that will help with either, you know, language issues or social behaviors or motor or some combination. I think there's so many options on the table right now. Okay, well, thank you so much. Dr. Fowler, do you have any questions? Oh, what a marvelous talk, um, uh, Jenna. Um, I'd like y'all to know that where, where this invitation came from is um, Dr. Kanopka presented this to a university-wide uh, seminar at the university. And we were, I, I watched it and I was so impressed and delighted and realized how very little I know on this subject. And so I invited her and she, she just was so happy to come and give the talk today. So what you just saw was a University of Texas Southwestern Grand Rounds Conference for the entire university. And um, uh, Jenna, I want to ask all the students uh, to please uh, put a thank you. Uh, you had a, a bit over 200. Uh, Jenna. Um, and just you watch the chat for just a little bit and you will see all these thank yous uh, pop up, which we think is a, a wonderful thing. Thank you everybody for doing that. <laughs> so Elena, you wanna tell us what that is? Yes, yeah, so we have the quiz uh, for this session and here's the barcode. Uh, we also have it in the chat and we have the session 28 quiz in the chat as well.
And this quiz will be due next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Well, once again, uh, thank you, Jenna. We're just so pleased and honored that you would join us. Oh, I knew you would be a rock star when, uh, when, when I asked you and you were so gracious to agree to come. Well, everybody, this is, um, this is it for virtual shadowing for the evening. I hope you will have a great evening ahead of you. We really appreciate uh, your coming. You really validate the work that we do every week. Uh, and we will be here in some form, uh, especially if you keep coming back. So um, on behalf of uh, uh, Dr. Kanopka and the whole working gr uh, group uh, team, who were uh, three we're sending off, uh, two uh, from this evening, uh, we're sending off to medical school, which is terrific. So uh, on behalf of the team, uh, Dr. Kanopka, and uh, me personally, this means so much. Uh, we want to uh, wish you a good evening.